for warm up. I want to thank uh, Mike Cadwell for this invitation. It's a great honor to be here. I want to thank KB Jones for her incredible introduction. I always feel very humbled to be described thus. Um, I want to thank the most important person in the audience for this book would not exist without him, my beloved husband, Roger Ray. Um, without the love of a good person in your life, nothing is possible. And I want to remind everybody that nothing happens uh, as a solo work. And finally, I want to thank my co-author, um, Igor Marjanovic, um, who was a stalwart equal partner in crime in this book, and we keep joking that it takes a East, couple of Eastern Europeans to write about a great, great American icon. Um, of course, also, this book would not have been possible um, without some financial help uh, from the Graham Foundation uh, for the Fine Arts, who helped enormously with the image costs for this book, um, and uh, for Bowling Green State University's and Washington University in St. Louis's funding that helped to cover the difference that the Graham could not. So without all of these people, this book wouldn't exist. I'm going to begin by reading, and then I'm going to go to a uh, um, more animated talk. I, I just told my wonderful tech assistants I did a trial run of this talk with my students uh, yesterday. I teach an 8 a.m. class, so those of you in the audience know how awful that is. Um, and the advice from my students was, great talk, but please be animated. So I'm going to try and be animated, um, even though it's later in the day now. So, um, prologue. Memory of an imaginary inhabitant. I turn onto Dearborn Street. Across the river, I glimpse Marina City for the first time. The towers rise above the city skyline, the winter sky casting deep shadows on the towers, ramps, and balconies. The Marina City complex rises from the horizontal plain of the river in sheer, if still restrained, exuberance. I walk to it, and the towers now loom above me as I crane my neck upward, paying respect. Down below, boats huddle in the marina, wrapped for the winter. I rush up the ramp to the plaza level. Cars arrive, stop, others are already there, Waiting, valets arrive, jangling keys, get in, and as I watch, riveted, an astonishingly fast drive up the parking ramps takes place, even as other cars drive down at more deliberate speed. Other valets step onto a moving vertical conveyor belt, rising upwards towards the waiting cars. I think to look up, and am in awe, a dizzying spectacle framed by two circular towering forms and a long, straight, vertical plane, residential towers and an office building, pulls me into the vast void of the sky. My eyes and my body want to leap upward. I am suspended in the vertiginous blue. A car honks. Get out of the way. Turning, I am anchored by the solid, gray, lead-clad form of the theater building. It, too, floats on sheer glass of the lobby floor at its base. The lead surface above seems so tactile. I sense the presence of the human hand in the unevenness of its surface and the rhythm of the seam cleats. I enter through the sheer glass lobby, past large gridded and colored paintings, and teak-lined reception desk, back now in the practical world. Descending on the escalator to the floor below, to the busy street linking the two towers, in the rental office my business begins. The rent is just beyond what I can afford, but it is close to work and I will save on travel. I know I have to live here. 
in the very heart of my extraordinary American, German, Polish, Italian, African-American city of alleyways, railways, waterways, tunnelways, highways, airways. The rental agent and I walk through more sheer glass doors into the elevator lobby. The elevator doors close. My ears pop as we whoosh upwards. The agent explains that these are the fastest elevators in the city. First, we go to the 61st floor, the roof deck. Exiting through the small, solid door of the circular elevator call, I stop in astonishment. In front and all around me, beyond the thin, black steel railings at the edge, lies the breathtaking panorama of the city. After the compressed enclosure of the elevators, the endless vista is stupefying. Beneath our feet, sloping as if to form a shallow segment of a large sphere, my mind conjures up the globe of the world, is the pale roof deck, glaringly bright, making this vast space feel hot, even with a chilly winter breeze on my face. I feel I could be standing on top of the world. Unable to grasp this experience, I follow the rental agent back to the elevator and we descend to the 50th floor. The rental agent opens the apartment. Nearest to the door, she shows the compact kitchen with sleek steel kitchen cabinets. Everything is there, stainless steel blender, toaster and mixer, even a television set. To the right, I see the equally compact dressing area with mirrors from wall to wall, then the closet spaces and bathroom. The latter sparkles with glass mosaic tiles. The bedroom beyond, the, beyond has floor to ceiling glass and a door onto half a balcony, divided from the next apartment by a metal partition, a semi-sheltered space, perfect for reading a book. We turn back and walk out of the bedroom bathroom suite into the living room. I gasp. In front of me, I see more wall-to-wall, floor-to-ceiling glass, punctuated only by thin aluminium mullions. Sunlight penetrates deep into the apartment, a welcome gift of midwinter warmth. Beyond this glass picture window is an enormous curved vanilla balcony. Its certainly circular floor and ceiling form a warm, comforting enclosure, enveloping and wrapping me, even as they compel the eye beyond into the vast view they frame. I am pulled toward the balcony. As I open the door, the sound of the city hits me. Sirens screech and cars honk above the hum of general traffic. I walk to the balcony edge. Before me is, again, the stunning urban panorama. Beyond lies glittering Lake Michigan, and in the far distance, tiny shafts of white smoke from Michigan factories. To my right is the other tower, sharply silhouetted against the sky. Down 50 floors flows the deep green, ice-speckled Chicago River, leading to the, marina city, to, to the marina at the base of the complex, after which the complex is named. As I lean over the balcony, above me is once again the endless ice blue sky, yet the sun warms my face and the balcony shelters me. From this beautiful, spacious, enveloping architectural opera box, I see and feel the city of Chicago in its full grandeur and life. This is to be my first day in my Chicago home. So now I will move on to a more informal narrative. Um, this is a memory of an imaginary inhabitant, but it is also my memory. Uh, my memory of my first visit to Marina City when I arrived in Chicago in 1996 and had four hours to find an apartment to live and was astonished to find that Marina City was at that time the cheapest downtown location in which you could rent, um, and was shocked to find out that it had a bad reputation with Chicagoans, because for Europeans, Marina City is a symbol of you know, a great heroic American era when architects could work within um, the 
political and economic system to achieve uh, tremendous architectural and social feats. Um, of course, I signed up on the spot um, and then lived in Marina City for three years. Uh, while the project was undergoing reconstruction and while it slowly its fortunes were reviving. And that began my love affair with Marina City. And hence the book, um, the only book on Marina City, um, the only book solely in English that touches upon the work of Bertrand Goldberg. There is one book out of print, printed in 1980s, uh, which was published in France in association with an exhibition of Goldberg's work. But there is no American publication, or indeed no other publication about Goldberg. So this has been a, you know, a passion and a 10-year project, uh, which finally came to fruition this year. Um, without a doubt, as you can see here, Marina City is a Chicago icon. And for a city that chooses to define itself by its architecture, a city that sees itself as the architecture capital of the United States, and a city uh, which in canonical um, historical accounts of the birth of modernism uh, features large both in the works of um, Pevsner and Gideon, it is hardly surprising um, that um, it is a city that has architectural icons. And therefore, it is even more surprising to find that Marina City really doesn't have a publication uh, to celebrate its importance, not only as a piece of architecture, but as, a, uh, as an important contribution to urban design, labor politics, and indeed, Chicago identity. When it was built, Marina City introduced new ideas about form, structure, living and working, and adopted innovative urban, political, financial, construction, and marketing strategies to do so. And today's talk is not going to be only about architecture. It's going to be about two other important to topics. The money and masquerade that KB talked about. Architects cannot achieve their goals unless they understand money. Architects also cannot achieve their goals unless they understand marketing or the act of performance, whether it's printed, personal, social, that makes projects come together. Architects do not work alone, but have to work within systems that involve finance and relationships, and therefore, money and masquerade are crucial to the history of modernity. As it happens, back in the late 50s when Marina City was created, that was a world where men made those things happen. That is changing. Hence, men, money, masquerade, and modernity. Um, commissioned in 1959 by the Building Service Employees International Union, colloquially known as the Janitors Union, Marina City was what reporters at the time called a house that janitors built. Yet its merger of formal sophistication and social ambition owes as much to its architect as it does to Chicago culture and politics. Architectural modernism is full of tales of heroic architects who single-handedly transform culture um, and through their buildings redeem society by providing new visions of urban living. That kind of narrative has been challenged dramatically by both practicing architects and historians and the general public. Um, so when I'm going to talk to you about the important role that Goldberg played in this building, I'm very mindful of not reinforcing the notion of the architect as hero. However, I also want to emphasize that in the 1950s, in the climate that Goldberg found himself in Chicago, he actually did play 
a pivotal role in this building. He was not alone. This was a partnership um, that involved many people, but he brought a unique skill set to the project um, that included a very finely honed communication skills and a unique personal history that made him prepared to step into the condition that he encountered. Bertram Goldberg, let me go back one. There we go. Can't go backwards. Never mind. You saw the picture of Goldberg. Um, Goldberg was born, grew up, practiced, and died in Chicago. His family were tradespeople. His grandfather was a brickmaker. And perhaps that explains the very practical side of his personality. On the other hand, his sister, Lucille Goldberg Strauss, um, as a young woman, joined the Goodman Theater in Chicago and introduced her brother to ideas about performance, stage lighting, um, and theater. Um, Goldberg's first ambition, however, was not, neither to be an architect nor an actor. He wanted to be a writer and was one of those kids, you know, that wrote his own newspaper and, you know, um, then wrote the school newspaper and all of that kind of thing. Um, he had a very influential teacher as a young man in high school called George Vobel, who taught him how to think backwards. In another way, in other words, he, he taught him to take a situation and then follow its logical sources. And that provided him with a very interesting critical mind. Um, he was known in Chicago as a very quirky thinker that would immediately get to the soft spots in any argument, something that didn't always endear him to his colleagues. He uh, studied at the Harvard School for Boys in Chicago, which prepared him to go to Harvard University, where he arrived just as the Great Depression was in full flow. And there he encountered not only some leading thinkers of the age, uh, namely the humanists Irving Babbitt and Alfred North Whitehead, but a culture in which students and professors alike were seeking solutions to the great social problems that the United States was facing. However, he also encountered the faltering Beaux-Arts tradition and his dean, Henry Atherton Frost, advised him, advised him rather than go to Paris to study at the Ecole de Beaux-Arts, which is where most students prior to that generation went, his dean advised him to go to the Bauhaus. And so at the age of 19, Goldberg set off for Germany. This was 1933. Um, uh, the, the National Socialists, the party of Hitler, is rising rapidly uh, in power. And Goldberg arrives in Berlin in the last year of Bauhaus existence. Um, he's a Jew, and so he is also encountering um, uh, rising anti-Semitism. But because he's um, extrovert, um, gets in with the crowd very fast, Within a few months of getting to the Bauhaus, he's designing the invitations to the last Bauhaus festival. Um, this was a lucky find in the Bauhaus archive. Um, and already you can see, you know, he's 19 years old, circles, minimalism, the invitation's about this big, economy, efficiency, color, these are all things that would uh, begin to uh, characterize his work later on. Um, this is uh, one of his student projects. Actually, I have to thank Joe Rosa, who um, is now at the University of Michigan Art Museum, for locating these uh, in, in the archives at Harvard. I dug around there for a whole year and never find, found these dang things. There's a whole body of Goldberg's student work from the Bauhaus that he gave to the Bush Reisinger Museum. So you can see, study of circles. Um, uh, his work is being taught by um, uh, Vasily Kandinsky, Ludwig Hilbersheimer. He gets to apprentice for Mies van der Rohe 
and Lily Reich. Um, so he's getting the full Bauhaus experience. He's also getting exposed to ideas about performance, the Bauhaus theater, uh, um, while he's at the school. But a very influential meeting is um, he meets a Russian revolutionary, uh, the Menshevik economist called Vladimir Wojtynski, who is desperate to learn English because he wants to emigrate to the United States. So Goldberg uh, teaches Wojtynski English, and in return, Wojtynski is teaching Goldberg about economics. So at the Bauhaus, he's basically getting fully immersed in what we all know is the Bauhaus agenda, the integration of design and industry, new formal experiments based on abstraction, the idea that uh, the social program is critical to architecture, um, but he's also getting fully immersed in the inter interrelationship of urbanism, economics, and politics, particularly through Wojtynski. Um, very, very important period um, in his life. He f has to flee Berlin um, when he is uh, denounced by his landlady, um, or at least that's one of the stories. Um, the other story is that he simply ran out of money and his parents ordered him to go home. One of the pleasures about working on this book is uh, we work closely with uh, Bertrand Goldberg's son, Jeff Goldberg, who's also an architect and knows his father's work inside out, who warned us that Goldberg had ways of embellishing the truth. Um, and so even his oral history perhaps needs to be taken with a pinch of salt. And we try to cite from it as little as possible in the book, um, but um, there are some very interesting passages in, in the book. In any case, whether he flees or he has to leave because he's out of money, he comes back to Chicago um, to study at the Armour Institute because, of course, he wants to take his licensing exam, and so he's going to get ready you know, for all of that and somehow squeeze his Bauhaus education into, uh, back into the Midwestern architectural context. He goes to work, <coughs> first of all, for uh, Keck and Keck, um, um, and then also for Howard T. Fisher and Paul Schweiker, all three architectural firms at the kind of leading edge of what was then kind of Midwestern uh, modernism. And he sets up his own practice. This is one of his early projects, uh, the North Pole Ice Cream Store. Um, you can already see some similarities to Marina City. There's a central pillar, and then the whole building kind of hangs off the central pillar. It's a building that arrives literally on the back of a truck and is unfolded and installed in place. So you can see Goldberg's already working with ideas for prefabrication, um, you know, function. He's already got the all-glass exterior. He gets fascinated by uh, uh, prefabricated building components. This is a, um, a project he very fondly called Unican. Um, which is a prefabricated bathroom, kitchen, you know, toilet. Um, and he also starts to do, um, he starts to do his own graphic design. Being a good Bauhaus trained architect, he, you know, he believes he can do it all. Um, and indeed what he's doing is he's translating from the German context to the American context a value system that it was based on industry. This was a period still in the United States when most architecture was in the Art Deco style or even you know, in the Beaux-Arts tradition. And indeed, he also talks about Mies saying, I quote, the discipline of taking a total design and out of that totality working out the details, the discipline of creating an aesthetic out of the structure the discipline of seeking an alliance with an industrial world, that discipline I still have. The Great Depression and World War II is a part of all of this because during World War II, there is a profound shortage of materials. So he's working, in this case, 
not with steel, which is being used in the war effort, but with plywood, uh, designing uh, prefabricated uh, plywood railway cars gets as far as getting this um, uh, funded, but then is thwarted because the steel industry um, lobbies successfully against uh, the implementation of plywood railroad cars because uh, that would mean uh, loss of jobs. Um, and he's starting to take these ideas about prefabrication into high-end um, residential architecture. This is the Snyder House, um, which is uh, no longer in place. It's um, out on the East Coast. And what he's doing when he's dealing with prefabrication, this is very important for Marina City, is he's beginning to work with trade unions. Um, trade unions at this time were heavily suspicious of anything to do with prefabrication because prefabrication in theory means loss of jobs for union men. Um, and so he's figuring out ways to overcome union resistance to prefabrication by um, figuring out ways to actually unionize the construction industry production line. So what he's doing is he's bringing um, prefabrication technology to the construction in industry, but then also working with the unions to make sure that the men who are working on the production line get well paid. This establishes his first connections with the trade union movement, which will become very important in getting the Marina City project. Plus, also, in order to, do, to work with these prefabricated projects, he's having to work with the Federal Housing Association in, uh, uh, in, in uh, Washington, D.C. To, fu to help fund the projects. Two very, very important relationships. Remember, he's still a really young guy. Um, you know, he's, he's in his um, um, late 20s, and he's on the one hand lobbying major industrialists, on the other hand, you know, lobbying in Washington to get funding and legislation changes. He even does a little project that doesn't get built, and by the way, sorry, this is back to front for some reason. Um, uh, and he starts to depart from the Miesian precedent. Um, he basically realizes when doing a square building and doing all of the detailing in a square building that uh, there is no economy in a rectilinear building because of all the unique detailing that occurs at corner conditions and so on. He, he realizes that the idea of efficiency behind uh, the, the, the gridded building is actually a myth. However, um, there is no way that the scale of work that he has could predict the scale of the project he's about to get or indeed the way that it would catapult his practice into the international domain. Um, those of you who are practicing architects or have worked for practicing architects here know it is not easy to make the tradition, transition from residential scale into large scale housing projects. Um, Everybody needs a stroke of luck. Uh, well, it comes, um, it comes to him in the form of an encounter uh, with two individuals. William McFetridge, president of the Janitors Union, and Charles Chuck Swibel, president of the real estate firm Marks & Company. Goldberg meets uh, McFetridge because he's asked to do uh, the remodeling of the janitor's union offices. So never turn down that little job um, that seems very unglamorous. Um, he meets McFetridge um, and through McFetridge he meets Chuck Swibel um, who is uh, the union's realtor. The three of them form a very unlikely partnership. At the time of Marina City's creation, McFetridge was nearly 70 years old, a, a highly important figure in the US labor movement, prominent in the AFL-CIO, 
a Catholic and a very close confidant of Mayor Daley. In fact, McFetridge is responsible in large part for the first Mayor Daley's successful bid to become the mayor of Chicago in 1954 that launched Daley's reign as what has become he, the title that he's become known for as America's Pharaoh. In other words, the most powerful mayor in 20th century American history. Um, however, as, uh, and by the way, McFetridge is in the middle. Um, Goldberg on the left and Swibel on the right. Um, however, as Marina City was coming to fruition, um, McFetridge decided to step down after many, many years uh, as, as president of the union. Um, it was a voluntary stepping down and a handing over to his longtime uh, protege, David Sullivan, who promptly, uh, upon being, getting the presidency, uh, proceeded to stab McFetridge in the back, and McFetridge then tried to re regain the presidency, which may not you know, may not be important except that Marina City turned into the battleground over which this leadership uh, war was waged. And eventually, unfortunately, Marina City became the victim of that battle. Chuck Swibel on the right was, like Goldberg, very young. He was only 35. Um, he was born in Poland as Shire Chaim Zweibel. He met McFetridge on a trip to Israel and shortly afterwards, Marx and Company became the union's realtors. In 1956, Mayor Daley, because obviously McFetridge was close to Daley, appointed Swibel as commissioner and treasurer of the Chicago Housing Authority, allegedly influenced by McFetridge, um, who wanted someone at the CHA who would represent the janitor's union interests. Janitors are needed to look after buildings. So you've got to have, this is Chicago politics. I'm sure you have a milder version of it, much milder version of it in Columbus. Um, uh, Swibel's uh, track record from the beginning was not stellar. Uh, the Chicago papers frequently called him a slum landlord. And there are tales of Marx and companies, uh, uh, dealings with their tenants that uh, we found in Chicago newspapers that we only briefly mention in the book because, uh, uh, well, it's not a pretty story and uh, we wanted to be careful. Um, the idea of Marina City is rooted in, their, in the combination of their aspirations. Um, on the one hand, Goldberg's desire to merge modern, ide modern, modern architectural ideals with ideas about social integration and urban renewal. These are architectural ideas that touch upon urban politics. McFetridge, on the other hand, wanted to invest union money in downtown real estate, take pension fund money, and bring a greater profit for his membership than was available through other investment tools. And also, in building Marina City, um, and hopefully projects like it to follow, he was creating more jobs for his men because those buildings needed janitors too. And then finally, Zweibel wanted to uh, make money. He was a real estate developer. But he not only wanted to uh, make money, he also wanted to change the way that people regarded cities. And in this area, all three of them had something in common, which is the idea that you could build downtown housing for middle, low to middle income people and basically revitalize the city center. And in that, they were heavily aided and abetted uh, by the first mayor, Daly, who saw the revival of downtown as one of his, uh, one of the marks that he could leave on the city, a legacy that eventually proved to be successful. All of these aspirations converged on a hot summer day in 1959 after a lunch at Fritzl's restaurant on State Street. Goldberg later recalled the moment, and I quote, and this is where you have to take things with a pinch of salt. 
I quote, I said to Bill McFetridge, you asked me to find you a piece of property. We have nine pieces of property, eight of which are within the budget that you suggested to me, and the ninth of which is too rich for your blood. He said, what one was that? I said, we can walk out of Fritzel's here and I'll show it to you, and we did. The three of us stood out there on the sidewalk and I said, there. He looked at it and he said to Chuck Swibel, see what you can buy it for. Chuck Swibel succeeded in buying it without any money until we had FHA, Federal Housing Authority, approval, until we had all these other things that gave us assurance of success. End of quote. So you can see this is, this is, this is the men, this is the big guys looking at a big site. You know, the, the, the really important site in the center of Chicago. Marina City was the largest financial partnership between federal union banking and business interests ever seen in a housing complex on the American continent. The trio's astute financial know-how and political connections made the project possible and included tireless fundraising and boosterism, such as this event at the Astor Hotel in New York City. We see Goldberg speaking, McFetridge next to him, and the guy with the glasses is uh, McFetridge's nemesis, David Sullivan. Um, the complex was extremely efficiently designed, uh, costing about 10 to $12 a square foot. Um, however, Design efficiency was not the only way the group managed to make the complex affordable. They also created cheaper money to fund the project. Swibel bought the, the land in the largest real estate transaction in Chicago's history, but he did not pay a cent until the project had Federal Housing Authority mortgage insurance. You've been hearing a little about that <coughs> recently, um, you all know how, you know, without that mortgage insurance, the whole thing starts to collapse. Well, they had to get federal housing insurance, uh, housing uh, authority insurance, because otherwise bankers would not come and provide the money to fund the project. Well, the only problem was federal housing authority insurance was only available for housing in the suburbs for nuclear families. Uh, city center housing was not considered to be suitable for families. So, Goldberg, McFetridge, and Swibel had to come up with an argument uh, that um, urban living in the, in the city center was suitable for families, and they went far beyond that. They actually managed to persuade the FHA that single and two-person uh, units living you know, persons were, could be classified as families. This shows you the amount of masquerade or performance that is required to get this kind of architectural change to happen. Um, as a result, FHA insurance uh, was granted and the project turned out to be the largest commercial transaction in the city's real estate history and the second largest uh, transaction, real estate transaction, in the whole nation after the Empire State Building. And the reason I'm sharing all of this with you is Mar the history of Marina City to date is understood to be one of architectural and structural verb. And indeed it is, we'll get to that in a minute. But it is also a phenomenal achievement in terms of um, economics, and as you'll see later, marketing. McVetridge and Swibel largely drove the financial end of the project, and Goldberg brought to it something the two of them did not have. Um, establishing and adapting a marketable program, presenting it to funders, he was a good public speaker, pursuing the design and construction efficiencies, and very importantly, running the project's publicity. Marina City had a powerful publicity machine. However, the efficiency and the, uh, of, of the design not only related to architecture, engineering, and funding, it also related to the program. 
His concept of living above the store or integrating housing, office, leisure, and commercial activity was highly financially astute. He wrote, I quote, Marina City will be a two-shift city. Without both a daytime and nighttime population, the cost of recreation, garage, rents, taxes would all be higher. There is no working unit, business, recreational, residential service, which by itself can stand the high cost of the central city. So you can see that seemingly utopian ideal of combining many programmatic ideas within a single complex also made powerful financial sense. However, Chicago zoning laws forbid um, mixed-use development. Um, and so uh, the trio had to go on yet another political uh, uh, persuasion uh, um, agenda. They managed to persuade the Chicago Planning Authority to reclassify the site as an entire urban district, which meant that it could become um, uh, a mixed-use development, and indeed it became a planned urban development, another first for the city of, of Chicago. They managed to get um, uh, FHA uh, mortgage insurance, but then they hit another financial snag, and that was that they didn't quite have enough money to build the project, even with the insurance. And I quote Goldberg again, and again, take it with a piece, pinch of salt, but he actually did save the project in this way, but this is what he said. I got approval for a certain amount of money, but it was a million dollars shy of what we needed. We had only until the next day at noon to get FHA approval. I went to John Wayner, who was the head of the FHA in Chicago. I said, we are a million dollars shy, John, and at 12 o'clock today, it will be too late. I either have your approval for another million dollars by 12 o'clock, or the project is dead. By the way, a million dollars in those days is a lot more than it is today. Um, I continue, John, you have to increase the rental income of each room in this project by 50 cents a month. I had done my homework. John called in his chief underwriter. The two of them looked at me and said, we'll give you the 50 cents a month, end of quote. As a result of that decision, a group of bankers came to the project, a consortium of East Coast banks finagled through the union's connections, as well as Chicago's largest bank, the Continental Illinois Bank, became the stakeholders in a, this $38 million project. General Electric provided $2 million worth of loans to the project to fund electrical equipment, the largest loan it had ever made. Low loan and construction costs made the rentals more affordable. Therefore, there were 2,500 applicants for uh, 900 apartments by 1962. Also, the project started to generate taxation income for Mayor Davies coffers. Another reason he was interested in reviving the downtown, just in case you thought he was just an idealist. Um, indeed, in 1961, uh, two years after the Marina I City idea emerged, the Chicago Sun-Times reported that 26 major buildings had been built or started in the previous few years. Marina, Marina City's name was thought up by uh, Chuck Swibel's wife, Cena, and it encapsulates the ambition of the project, the notion that low to middle income workers would each have a boat down in the dock, um, you know, on which they could go whooshing along the Chicago River. And indeed, Swibel wrote, I'd love to be among the first to find the formula for young people just married, the ideal place in the city, because then I could, would, could prove to all because then I would prove all the experts wrong about the exodus to the suburbs. Yet, not to forget the architect, the originator of the vision, the material presence of the building, was its architect. His ideas seasoned in the Depression, European interwar turmoil, and World War II. He believed that architecture within a free market democracy must embrace industry and equality he called it capitalism for the common man. 
He tempered these ideals with a worldview encompassing tradition, history, and humanism. He admired medieval cathedrals, uh, Italian towns, and above all, urbanity. He referred to Marina City over and over again as a city within a city, embracing urban density and diversity at a time of suburban white flight. In his European photographs, people and buildings coexist in a continuum of exterior and interior spaces. Embodying these ideas, Marina City comprised five buildings, office tower at the end, theater in the middle, two residential towers, a uh, podium on which all of them sat, and um, then you can see in the illustration also a base on which the office building sat, which contained a bowling alley and swimming pool. The, the towers uh, comprised 20 floors of spiraling parking, and 40 floors of efficiency, one bedroom, and from the 50th floor upwards, some two bedroom apartments. Fittings were custom designed, necessitated by the non-rectilinear plan, but the number of apartments made their mass production economically viable. The tight planning, by, uh, which had to fit FHA standards, was compensated for by a panoply of amenities. From the vast roof deck, to the leisure spaces in the commercial base, pool, shops, cinema, and so on. So you can see there's already a way of compensating for the small space with, with ideas about consumption. And this was the, you know, that was the way that the low in and middle income nature of the project was uh, um, uh, basically balanced. The importance of the site was, was, was critical. It occupied the original lot number one of the city of Chicago. See the lot right at the far end, at the top on the right? That is why it was too rich for the blood. It was the founding piece of land in the history of Chicago, and therefore also a symbol of its downtown renaissance. Goldberg uh, masterminded the groundbreaking ceremony brochure overlaying an image of Fort Dearborn with, uh, you know, on top of the picture of Marina City to drive home the importance of the site. The groundbreaking ceremony on Thanksgiving Day in 1960 uh, absolutely gave uh, form to the history of the site. Uh, all of the local dignitaries dressed up as sons of Kinsey, the first settler in Chicago um, and the owner of that first piece of land. Everything about the groundbreaking was heroic and in Chicago's best tradition, highly political. The creators of Marina City understood the national significance of this project. Here at the groundbreaking ceremony, McFetridge is on the telephone to President-elect uh, John uh, JFK. Um, and this conversation encapsulates not only the endorsement by the highest level of federal leadership through the political machine that McFetridge, Daly, etc., occupied, but it also reiterated the importance of Daly to Kennedy's administration. Indeed, Kennedy needed McFetridge's support in order to gain the presidency, as we will see later. Uh, Goldberg masterminded additional uh, publications, the Silver Book and the Red Book, um, for uh, the commercial and the residential parts of the building, respectively. Um, he uh, included in these little templates so that you could actually draw furniture inside um, them to plan uh, the interiors. This was not his only genius. His theatrical background led him to create uh, uh, mock showroom apartments in the union's headquarters on Dearborn Street, which included a series of panoramic photographs taken from a helicopter at roughly the location at which the uh, uh, project's balconies were to be located. And these became extremely popular places for both the general public and dignitaries to visit. 
Uh, McFetridge took his formal photo on the balcony, and here on the right is uh, Goldberg with Ira Bach, the guy, uh, the Chicago city planner who uh, ha was able to change the ordinance to make uh, the building happen. Um, Goldberg was not above a little sleight of hand. When he went to the FHA to try and get uh, the funding, uh, the mortgage regulations, regulations changed, he showed them a square scheme because he knew that was far more familiar. He believed that they couldn't handle a circular project. Uh, the moment approval was gained and he returned to Chicago, the circular towers reappeared. Now, finance and marketing are two areas of Goldberg's talents that I think are really not well known. Hence our dedication in the book to a chap chapter for each of these. What is better known is his consummate talents as an architect, as an engineer. Um, shortly after groundbreaking construction began, the site became a spectacle for Chicagoans. In fact, I've met many people in Bowling Green who remember visiting uh, Chicago and you know watching the building go up. Um, there were innovative construction techniques involved. Mobile cranes from Denmark were imported that would rise up um, the elevator core as the, as the concrete was poured and uh, would use reusable precise fiberglass concrete molds. The buildings, the two towers were cast in an incredibly finely orchestrated rhythm where a floor was built each day. So every 48 hours there would be you know, a brand new cycle. Um, it, uh, one day, the, all of the rebars would be laid, the electrical, the dot work would be laid, the concrete would be poured. This started at 4 a.m. and ended something like 10 o'clock at night. Then the concrete would set the next day, and then um, the whole thing would be hoisted up, and the towers went up alternately from within the rebar cages, within the horizontal beams. And um, uh, here in a construction site photograph, what you also, what you, in addition to seeing those ducts, what you're also seeing is where the electrical conduit had to cross over and come up into walls. The office figured out a way to hide this within the internal wall th thicknesses of the apartments, which reduced the overall floor thickness of each floor by three inches, which in turn reduced the number and size of caissons, um, which created enormous cost savings. And this was all happening, that level of detailed design was all happening while the foundations were being designed. The curvilinear balconies, which transitioned the load from the horizontal to the vertical in a perfect structural flow, saved a great deal on rebar costs. Thus, although the fiberglass molds were expensive, the whole cost overall was much lower. It wasn't perfect. Um, the molds would buckle, and so some of the concrete had to be finished by hand. There was an intriguing relationship between the hand and the machine. When completed, Marina City was the tallest apartment complex in the world, the tallest concrete building with the fastest elevators of its day, and featured many other architectural firsts. Um, the project uh, began with sketches in 1959. The towers were finished in 63 and 64. The office building and the theater were completed in 64 and 67. So less than 10 years to build. Um, its mixed use program was the first in Chicago, as I already mentioned. This was the ice rink, which no longer exists. Down in the... Uh, Project base were all kinds of amenities, bowling alley, theater gym, swimming pool, restaurants, bank, TV station, florist, newsstands, beauty, barber, book and tailor shops. The National Design Center moved there. It was an incredibly rich program. Um, Alfred Corwell designed a small public garden. And importantly, the project also centered on ideas about visuality. Large balconies, breathtaking city views and light, delivered through floor-to-ceiling glass, compensated for lack of square footage. Um, this visuality was already promised in the Marina City showroom and simulated balcony views. 
Um, such an emphasis was not coincidental. Goldberg's understanding of the power of the image um, and the power of the eye um, really uh, played itself out in Marina City's opticality. Here we see King Simeon of Bulgaria taking a photograph from the balcony. Not a surprising gesture given the balconies were both stage sets that you could view from the interior, but also these opera boxes through which you could view the city of Chicago. Goldberg uh, did another smart thing. He hired the firm of Hedrick Blessing, uh, who were becoming the most famous uh, architectural photographers in Chicago, to photograph the building. And he also hired another wonderful photographer, Orlando Cabanban, to take other photographs. He realized that modern architecture was inseparable from its reproduction in the printed image. He was very interested in light and took, uh, asked Hedrick Blessing to take a series of photographs here in the mock showroom, day at night, very interested in the differences in those conditions. And uh, the same took place for external exterior photographs. He was trying to capture the life of the building uh, during the day and at night. He loved theater, as we've already seen. These are Goldberg employees in a mock-up of the office building, um, basically just having a good time, um, and obviously uh, showing that you could clean the windows from the outside. Such multiple image-making strategies established a Marina City as one of Chicago's most iconic buildings, and it began to appear everywhere. Uh, from United Airlines uh, poster advertising Chicago, and by the way, O'Hare Airport, or O'Hare Field as it was called then, had just been completed, and in fact the concrete crew from O'Hare Field went straight to work on Marina City. Um, to, of course, the most you know, glowing endorsement of any modern building to be on the cover of National uh, Geographic. And Marina City became synonymous with this new era um, in Chicago. And indeed, the British architectural critic, Rainer Bannum, wrote um, in the 1960s while walking the loop, I quote, most visitors will prefer to make for the symbol of the Chicago that is and will be the twin towers of Bertrand Goldberg's Marina City, far from perfected in detail, but so heroic in conception, so right for their site where Dearborn crosses the river, that they have the authority of a sketch for a possible third phase in the history of the Chicago school." End of quote. Marina City also quickly became an object of popular affection. Already in 1962, in a Chicago Daily News photograph named Corny Bart, the towers acquired their now familiar identity. And in 1964, a Daily News reporter wrote, people who sell postcards tell me that they sell more illustrating this unique piece of modern architecture than any other Chicago view. And you see on the left, Alvin Boyarsky, who was to become the most famous chairman of the Architectural Association, um, had a love affair with Marina City through his postcard collection. In fact, I am told it was the only Chicago building he really liked. Today, Marina, whoops, sorry. Today, Marina City um, fortunes have benefited from the real estate boom it foreshadowed. It indeed was the first downtown integrated housing, commercial, leisure complex, which now Chicago is absolutely peppered with. Um, but also, it suffered a bust that is also happening today. This is just to remind you, things don't just happen once. History is useful. You can learn from it today. Um, Marina City's ability to inspire drew us to write our book. Um, as images in the book as, and, and words attest in the book, Goldberg skillfully integrated ideas from the European avant-garde and the US market-driven building economy. Idealism and pragmatism, both. 
um, and addressing these broader themes, our book documents not only the architecture of Marina City and the architectural skills and partnerships needed for its realization, but also its position in 20th century US history, including the Great Depression, World War II, and the Cold War. And this is where I want to just start to range outwards a little bit. Um, Marina City, though a uniquely Chicago building, was also a product of these larger contexts. Contexts that have greatly changed in the half century since its conception, yet still hold lessons for the present. Goldberg saw the architect as a social facilitator in a broad democratic sense. Our book therefore shows Marina City as a confluence of design and social action. By examining the complex in this light, we try to illuminate broader architectural themes that speak to architecture's potential as an agent of urban and social change. Commissioned by a trade union, McFetridge, um, Marina City underlined the centrality of individual, social, and institutional relationships. For a trade union, a realtor and an architect to engage the most powerful US mayor in the 20th century. And here in a very telling image, you can, you can see the kind of relationship that Swibel was able to have with this powerful man. Um, for, that, for, the three of, for, the three, for the trio to engage Mayor Daly in this project, to realize these Busts, the largest deal, the tallest building, the, you know, um, to fully let uh, the apartments and to anticipate um, the future revival of downtown Chicago is a phenomenal, phenomenal achievement yet. Um, Marina City also fell prey to the kinds of tensions that these kinds of powerful partnerships engender the tensions between the individuals and the institutions. And here is another important lesson. No matter how powerful the relationships are, there isn't, um, that no group of individuals can withstand larger forces in history. Despite its success as an urban catalyst, Marina City had powerful detractors. David Sullivan, um, wanted the union to get out of Marina City because he didn't see it as affordable enough. Um, the battle was lost in 1964. Marina, uh, the union got out of the project. Swibel took it over. Swibel then, uh, um, his star was on the descendant. Uh, by 1967, he couldn't afford to pay the mortgage. The Continental Illinois took over the in, almost the entire project costs. It failed in the 1980s as part of the savings and loans crisis. You know, when Goldman Sachs went down and all these banks went down recently, very similar story. The moment the funders disappeared, the building fell into decades-long neglect. When I moved into the building, there were tales of prostitution somewhere on its floors. Um, it was inhabited by people who were not considered the best neighbors in Chicago because I was a European and in Europe you actually live next to red light districts because that's where the cheapest real estate is. Didn't bother me, but it was not a good address. And uh, my colleagues were a little worried about me. Um, however, in the late 1990s, um, when finally the financial situation had stabilized, new investors were found, the complex began to experience a revival, albeit for those of you who've been to see it now with some really funky architectural additions. However, those additions saved the building. Although the building fell uh, prey to um, infighting for a while, its star is once again on the ascendant. Nevertheless, there are some issues that I want to point out. For example, um, Marina City, although it centered on social integration, it really was social integration for male, white, heterosexual union workers. 
Women appear in Marina City in brochures in the kitchen. Um, in uh, Goldberg's office, they only got to do the interior design. The only picture we were able to find of a person of color was a black maid in one of the kitchens. Um, ideals of labor power and class mobility came in white male clothing. Yet the urban vision is flexible and has adapted itself to the new era. Here we see an image of Daly and uh, Kennedy at a, in a 30 minute broadcast on national television paid for by the Democratic Party of Cook County, showing the intimate relationship between Kennedy and Daly. When the Chicago political machine also started to wane, at McFetridge's union, Janitor's Union, shifted its headquarters to Washington, D.C., Chicago's star was also in the descendant. So the tale of Marina City parallels what went on in broader U.S. politics. Um, and if in Marina City for a time the devil of capitalism won over the angel of the common man, this was part of broader patterns of change. Finally, Marina City stood for yet another aspect of U.S. Um, and world um, culture and politics, that of the Cold War. Conceived two years after Sputnik's entry into space, Marina City's residential towers emphasized verticality, reaching up into the sky like two rockets ready for launch. They were also ideological. The tallest concrete structures, highest residential buildings, fastest elevators, all electric apartments, a car space and a boat dock for every resident, and a television in every room promoted capitalist plenty. Middle America could sleep in its lofty apartment, sure of its technological supremacy and superior lifestyle in an age when the world could end at the touch of a finger. Marina City's rise, fall, and rebirth are inseparable not only from the expansion of capitalism and its industrialization of production, but also from architectural and social history, and their transformation by the rise of consumerism and an international economy of images. Marina City built upon this historical trajectory. Here, in Beatrice Colomina's words, its rooms become a space that is not made of walls, but of images, images as walls, end of quote. Marina City's balconies showed, in Walter Benjamin's words, that the living room is a box in the theater of the world. This stage set quality was exemplified by the many movies in which the complex has starred, such as here, featured as Goldstein, or here, Mickey Wan, starring Warren Beatty. And here, finally, the famous picture, The Hunter, Steve McQueen's last movie with its famous scene, the filming witnessed by intrigued Chicagoans lining the Dearborn Street Bridge. So, to come to the end of the talk, Goldberg was a Midwesterner with a Bauhaus education, grandson of a brickmaker but with patrician in-laws. His uh, wife was the, the daughter of the Florsheim Shoe Empire. He had one foot in the cultural elite and hung out with people like Antonioni and Nureyev. And on the other hand, he had his other foot on the construction site. He was himself a representation of the marriage of idealism and pragmatism. The history of Marina City to date has, perhaps necessarily, appeared to be one of largely of images, with a particularly strong impact in Europe and the Far East. In the process, Political and economic narratives were erased, allowing Marina City to stand as a seemingly utopian urban model of formal and structural verve, an optical tour de force that sidestepped its dependence on a market-driven economy and complex political and social conditions. The capitalism within Marina City's urbanism was erased. This exclusion from many of Marina City's writings and visualizations and from much of architectural history, removes important tools and presents unrealistic expectations for architects. Although our work as historians has operated in the same world of images, texts, opticalities, and erasures, 
we have sought to address this imbalance. Probing the received history of Marina City, we hope to have presented it not only as a paradigm of pragmatic urbanism in its time, but also, if broader conditions permit, as a potential model for a future politically, economically, and culturally informed architectural practice. Thank you.